Before we kick off this episode of Headstrong, I want to talk to you about my series sponsor, Green Chef. Now, if you're anything like me, you are always on the go and rarely have time to even think about eating healthy, let alone going to the shop, picking out the right ingredients and then getting home and devoting loads of time to cooking these meals. Luckily, Green Chef are one step ahead. They deliver your ingredients and step-by-step recipe cards directly to your door, making it the easiest and most convenient way to keep healthy eating habits on track. Green Chef offers a wide variety of delicious recipes each week, with options including keto, vegan, flexitarian, lower carb and vegetarian diets. Even better, all of these recipes contain one or more of your five a day. What an absolute bonus. Green Chef recipes are developed and approved by qualified nutritionists, so you can relax knowing that your meals align with your dietary needs and lifestyle. So, get 40% off your first box and 20% off your next three boxes with the code HEADSTRONG. That's HEADSTRONG for 40% off your first box and 20% off your next three boxes with Green Chef. Hello and welcome back to Headstrong. This is a podcast hosted by me, Louis Strong, and I talk to a variety of people in the public eye about their lives, their careers, their experiences, to understand what the word headstrong means to them. And to me, it means to believe in yourself, to talk about your vulnerabilities and reinforce your self-worth. Now, on this episode of Headstrong, I was joined by the wonderful Belle Hassan. Belle and I chatted about her life growing up with a father who is an actor, her time at school, and some of her more formative experiences in life that shaped who she is today, as well as the whirlwind experience of Love Island and what that has done to her life, and the experiences of social media and the media outlets themselves. I really hope you enjoy this episode of Headstrong. And if you do, please do hit subscribe, share it, leave a rating. That would be amazing. Every little helps. Belle, thank you very much for joining me on Headstrong. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you for having me. My absolute pleasure. I mean, we're midweek. Well, actually, it's still at the beginning of the week. How's the new year started for you? 2022. Well, you know, it started positive, how it always does. So that's good. I'm working. I'm on a new fitness journey, which I'm really excited about. Did you have a New Year's resolution? Yeah, get rid of this lockdown weight. That's what I need to get rid of. Honestly, I've just not stopped eating, if I'm honest with you. Oh, I know, I know. What, what, what's your kind of been your go-to snack then? What's been like your secret treat that you have not had enough of? Rice cakes. I can't stop eating them. Salt and vinegar ones. Oh, oh, love the salt and vinegar ones. I'm all over that. Have you had the, like, <laughs> the ones with chocolate on top as well? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm keeping them ones a bit more of a secret because they're not really allowed. But, you know, oh, we're gonna get you on. just grass me up. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry. Um, let's, let's talk about everything before uh, the spotlight because I want to talk okay. about family first. Because as, as most people will know, your father is in show business. And what I want to talk about in terms of that is when you were a kid, how often were you experiencing show business? Were you taken to set? Were, you, were there scripts lying around at home? What did you know of it at, from a young age? I mean, yeah, I used to go on set a little bit with my dad. There were a couple of films that I was in with him, like little bits when I was younger. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, yeah, there was a few bits. There was always scripts everywhere. My dad was forever learning lines, forever 
you know, I was always filming him and running lines with him. Um, I'd do all of his self tapes. For anyone that doesn't know, that's basically you send a tape of yourself. It's like a video audition. Um, so I was forever filming them and reading the parts with my brother and my dad because my brother did a little bit of acting as well. And it was kind of like every time we'd go out, it was the pictures and the the fame side of things that I was seeing from a very young age. How are you with flashing lights? Well, God. I mean, yeah. I, I've got used to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that. When did you first get a sniff of show business and think perhaps this is an industry that you wanted to pursue and break into? Do you know what? I feel like I've never really had that. I think for me, I've always looked up to like actresses like Nicole Kidman and people like that. Some like, you know, top actresses, Natalie Portman. And I found the other day a, I must have done in school. It was dated back. I must have been about nine or 10 when I wrote it. And it was just like a presentation that I'd done for school, like talking about all these actresses and how I wanted to be an actress and things like that. So I think for me, I've I've kind of always liked the idea of acting. I'm always walking around doing different accents. But for me, the show business side of it, the the paparazzi and the asking for pictures and things like that, that kind of never interested me. The fame side of things actually was never of any interest to me. I mean, we'll come on to talk about how you've kind of managed and dealt with that later on in the podcast. But what I want to talk about then is school. Did you enjoy school? No. No. No, I didn't. Not at all. Absolutely not. I hated it. I hated it. Can you tell, can you go into a little bit more detail and depth as to why that was the case? So with school, my first school that I went to was Farrington's. It was a private school. I hated it. I just hated it. You know, there was so much gossiping. And I think with girls, you get a lot of the the bitchiness. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but I've said it now. (laughs) Um, You get, you get a lot of that. And I think for me, I, I don't like it. And I just, I really, I don't like the clickiness. Like all my friends now, I don't have one specific girl group. I'm friends with like a few people from this group, few people from that group, few people from here, few people from there. So it just, for me, it was just, I, I just hated it. I hated how clicky schools were. I hated that where it was a private school, it was kind of like, who's got the most money? Oh, I've got this. Oh, well, I've just got that. Oh, if you're getting this, I've got to have that. I'm not like that at all. Like, I just, no, it's just not for me. Um, I found as well, like I had a bit of a hard time fitting in. I felt like I've always been a little bit different to other kids. I don't even know why. I just feel like I'm quite upfront. And I think people either really love it or they really hate it. And when you're younger, people don't really know how to take that. So, you know, and moving forward from then, that was sort of the whole way through primary school and then up to year seven. Then I moved to America for a year. And I actually really enjoyed that school. I really loved that. Like, I, I loved that. I was only there for a year. My dad was working in America. We lived in LA. I loved it. I I'd got on with everyone. I was friends with everyone. And it was just, it was lovely. My teachers were lovely. I just, I just, I had an, I had a good time there. And then coming back, I went to a state school. It was kind of just the bitchiness again. It was just, I preferred it to the all girls school, the private school. I loved that it was mixed because I I always found that I was just one of the boys, that all my friends were boys. Mm. I even remember one of the playground stars, she can't do, she, she basically she she said something that wasn't very appropriate because all my friends are boys and I was like excuse me like she basically she basically called me a slut I'm not gonna get into it too much but she did and I was like these are my friends I, I'm, I'm not like with any of them none of them are my boyfriend they were all my friends I was just like I was like a girly girl but a tomboy girly girl if that makes sense so yeah I just found it hard at school I feel like I was quite naughty I didn't really, I don't like being told what to do. So teachers, classrooms, it just wasn't for me. It just wasn't. <laughs> um, I know that we're quite early into the podcast, but I really want to talk about a kind of a, an essential part of what was your childhood and something that is a topic that people are reluctant to talk about because it might well be taboo and people are scared of talking about it. But I know that you've talked mm-hmm. about it before and that was when mm-hmm. you were harmed from as a teenager. Yeah. Your experiences at school led to this uh, and a variety of other experiences. 
Can you talk to me about, not, maybe not the event of the first time, but what led you to be driven to this, this uh, action to yourself? Do you know what it was for me? I think it was such a big thing as well, like to talk about, like you said, people don't really want to talk about. And I thought it was such, it was a big deal that I wanted, to, I wanted to make it a thing so that girls could look at me or guys could look at me and be like, you know what? She's all right now. I'm going to be all right. Um, so like the first time, I can't really remember as such the first time, but it was like, I just remember being young, just feeling like I hated myself. Like I just, I hated myself. I hated the way I looked. I hated who I was. I just, I just, like I said, I, I just felt like I didn't fit in. I wasn't the same as other kids. You know, I grew up in a school where everybody kind of was all about money and all about this and their interests was were just so different to mine. It was all about being horrible to someone or starting here. And I just, I just, I just didn't like the clickiness. So I just felt like I'd never fitted in. And then it was kind of, it was more so when I came back from America and I was in the state school, I actually had my first boyfriend. I mean, silly boyfriend. Oh, that's a dog. Um, I had my first sort of boyfriend. You know, it was nothing serious. It was someone that like, I just kissed. Like, it was nothing like that. Like, I was with him for, like, a few months. And then I kind of, as you do at the age of, like, 12 or 13, you get to the point and you're like, I can't be with you no more. I don't, like, you know, it's a silly relationship. I'm a, I'm a child. So it was kind of like he got a bit controlling and he got really, like, a bit, it was just getting a bit weird. So I was like, you know what, I'm not into this. I was like, look, I don't want to be with you anymore. That's it, done. And then it was, it was kind of the, if you're not going to be with me, I want to kill myself. I don't want to live anymore. And I was like, oh, my God, at the age of 13, I'm being told that. Like, I blamed myself. And I was like, should I be with this person? Should I not? Should I this? Should I that? Then he went around the whole school lying and saying that I'd done this, I'd done that. My mum and dad didn't know I had a boyfriend. Like, I was not allowed a boyfriend. So I couldn't tell my mum any of this. I couldn't tell anyone. I was like dealing with it all by myself. And at the age of 13, I didn't know what a narcissist was. I didn't know what emotional manipulation was. I didn't, I didn't know any of that. So I'm trying to process it. And someone's constantly telling me, you're a bad person. You don't want to be with me. I want to kill myself because of you. You've made me sad. You're making me cry. This is your fault. And I was like, I just didn't know how to deal with it. And I think for me, I've, I've always feared being a bad person. I've never wanted to be a bad person. Like, I have OCD all the time. And my, one of my biggest things is like, I get like these thoughts. I'm like, I don't want to be a bad person. I don't want to be a bad. Does that make me be a bad person? If I do that, does that make me a bad person? So that's something that really like plays on my mind. I would never want anybody to think I'm a bad person. And I think, obviously, I cared for this this boy. He was like my best friend, and then we ended up being in a relationship. And obviously, I cared about him. I would never want to upset him. And when he was saying those things to me, it it, it really hit hard. And it was like I just couldn't deal with it. And I felt like hurting you I should be hurting as well it's quite sad really well thank you thank you for telling me that why did you feel like this was the only solution did you feel like that because of what was going on because you were so young as well that you didn't feel comfortable and brave enough to talk to anyone else about this because obviously the implications of what are going on was quite severe and I suppose now relationship advice is all all over social media and all these character traits and personalities and and advice and charities for that matter mm. uh, are loud and able to talk about it but was that was that missing for you I felt like when I was growing up there's there's so much now about mental health I feel like when I was growing up I felt like like people were going to judge me they were going to look at me different like people were going to treat me different I, I'm not a victim and I've always had that and I'm like I'm not a victim I'm not a victim I will say it till I'm blue in the face I hate that stigma that comes with mental health that you're branded this victim and I, I never wanted people to feel sorry for me like that was a problem between me and myself I never ever wanted anyone to know that I never wanted anyone to blame themselves for it you know and I think the thing is like I don't I don't even remember how it was something that came about I think I think it was in passing comment with with one of my friends, maybe how I first even heard about self-harm. And they had said that, you know, they they had a situation and it was kind of like I thought, oh, is, is that the right way to deal with it? I think it was something like that. It was something like 
I was talking to someone and they had, they had mentioned about self-harm and I was like, oh, what's that? And they were like, oh, people do that because of that. It's a conversation that I suppose kids just have. It's something that they've never heard of. And really, they're, they're giving out wrong information of what it is or how, how actually like damaging it can make you feel. And it's actually not, not the right answer. It's, when I got older, I got to a point where I was like, this is so silly. What am I doing? I was like, what, why, why am I doing this to myself? Like, how can I not love myself enough to be doing this? And it was like, when I started speaking to people, like when I, when my mum and dad found out everything, as soon as I would speak to them, I was like, oh my God, it rationalizes the whole, the whole situation. You know, I was like, oh, okay. And even after that situation was finished and done with, you know, the the self-harming carried on for a little bit. And it was more like any situations where I felt like I'd hurt someone or it, it, it just comes down to just, just not loving myself. And how did you get on the men then? Because I know that once it all came to a head and your mother found out about it initially, didn't she? Yeah. And you did talk, talk through it and then you sought help with a counsellor, didn't you? How fundamental was that to speak to a professional in the right way and understand that actually, of course, you knew that you weren't necessarily the victim, but even as you say, rationalise it and understand that actually you can, there, there are other solutions to this. Yeah, so... When everybody sort of like found out about it, my mom, my dad and everyone, they were obviously, of course, really supportive. And they were kind of like, why are you doing this? And I was like, I don't know. Like, I genuinely, I, I'm like a kid. I don't, I haven't got a clue. I don't know why I feel like this. I don't know why I can't express the way that I feel. I've never been someone that can't talk about the way I feel either. So I was like, I don't know why I feel like this. So I think for me, talking to a, my dad put me in touch. He's really, really good friends with, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. His name's Ali Campbell. He is amazing, like amazing. And he got me in touch with him. I went for a few therapy sessions and he was like, this is normal. Like as much as you think you're a weird kid for having self-harmed and things like that, he was like, I see girls and boys every week that have done the same thing. It is so common. And he actually said it was, it was more common in women than it was men. But maybe that's just because men find it a little bit more difficult to talk out about. But he said that in his cases that he's seen, he found it more common in young girls that they were doing that. And he was like, it's normal. Like, it's okay and it will get better. He was like, the self-harming, let's get to the root of it. And he was like, look, you, you've got OCD, like you have. And I was like, okay. And he was like, this is this is what's happening. You're You're driving yourself mad. And he was like, you know, I said to him, I feel like my head's always busy. Like, there, there we, like you know, we've all got an internal voice in, in our heads that, like, you know, your conscience of such. And it'd be like, you know, I'd be thinking to myself, I, well, well, you must be a bad person. Well, no, I'm not a bad person because it's not my fault. And they're like, but maybe, maybe, no, you are. But then this, but then that. And then it would just be ticking about faults. I remember before my OCD got so bad, I couldn't even walk down the road without, if one foot touched a red paving stone, I would have to go back and find, I'd try and walk on and ignore it. And then I'd be like, no, no, no I've got to go back and find it. I can't, I cannot go on. And I'd have to walk back and try and find the same paving stone. And I'd be stood there for like 10 minutes, like, like driving myself mad. And he was like, listen, close your eyes. I was like, okay, close my eyes. And he was like, now take, he was like, where are your thoughts? Point to where in your brain. And I obviously pointed wherever. And he was like, right now, imagine those thoughts were on a radio. So I was like, okay. And I was thinking, where is he going with this? I'm sitting here. I'm like, is he getting me out here? Like, is he having me on? I was thinking, is he, is he taking the mic? I was like, what's going on? So he was like, right. I was like, just go with it. You've got nothing to lose. So he was like, put them thoughts on a radio. Imagine they're coming out of a speaker. So I was like, okay. He was like, now take that radio. And he was like, close your eyes and really imagine it and put it in the corner of the room. So I was like, okay. And he was like, now them thoughts are playing at you, aren't they? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, now turn it down. Like turn it down, like phys- physically turn it down. And I was like, oh my God. It's silent. I was like, there's silence in my head for the first time in like two years. There is silence in my head. And I was like, I can hear like nothing it's it was it was like game changing and it was something so simple and it it's it it's worked for like my whole life if ever I'm really stressed out I've got a lot of thoughts going on I'm I'm confused about say even as such a simple task as clearing out my room I'll sit thoughts over there turn them down and it just it 
it was just mind blowing, literally. So do you still use visualization and techniques that you've learned throughout your life? Yeah, definitely. I, I have kept that with me since I think I first see the the therapist. I want to say that word. I was going to say counselor, but I wasn't sure if say therapist or counselor. I don't know if there's a difference there. So Up if I'm you. offended anyone, you know, I apologize. But yeah, I first started seeing him. He did a bit of hypnotherapy on me as well, which was amazing. And I first started seeing him, I think I was about 16, maybe 17. Wow. So yeah. And it, it was it just cha- it just literally changed everything. You know, I dealt with things in such a different way. And don't get me wrong, there were times where I felt really like roped back into that mindset. But it was easier to be like, no, this is okay. Like I could now talk to myself properly, like and deal with it. And I think for me it was always really important that I didn't want to have to rely on anyone else, a boyfriend or my mum or my dad to help me. I wanted to be able to do things myself. <laughs> What I want to ask you then is how important do you think it is for individuals to actually willingly say, do you know what? It's good to stay in check with myself and go and see a professional and seek advice or help. And I'm not saying that it should happen every week, but if you need it, you shouldn't feel afraid or feel like it's a vulnerability to do so. No, I don't, I don't think anyone should be scared to say that. I mean, don't get me wrong. When my dad said, yeah, I want you to see this guy. Like, he's amazing. I was absolutely petrified. I was like, I'm going to have to talk about the way I feel. He's going to ask me all these questions that I don't know the answers to. And even still to this day, I don't have all the answers. You know, people ask me questions about it all the time. And I'm like, I don't know. But it is so important. That's why it's important with yourself to check in and be like, how are you feeling? Do you need to talk to someone especially a professional, because sometimes your mum or dad might not know what to say. Your friends might not know what to say. Like your brothers or sisters might not know what to say. So somebody that is trained in it, somebody that knows what they're talking about, it's important to check in with yourself. It's important to make sure that you know how you're feeling, make sure that you understand how you're feeling so that if you're not in tune with yourself, when something's a little bit off, you're not going to realise it until it's a serious situation. So just make sure you're checking in regularly. How are you feeling today? You know, are you feeling okay? I'm not feeling okay today. That's all right. Do you need to speak to someone? No, you know what? I'm good. Or yeah, you know what? That's a good idea. And you can always speak to, you know, my friend, she was going through a bit of a hard time and she actually went to her GP. I didn't even know you could do this. She went to her GP and she said that she was really struggling and they actually set her up with a counsellor as well. So you can go to your GP and talk to them. If you don't want to pick up the phone, and have a conversation, don't feel comfortable with that, you can always go to your GP and actually speak to someone. And, and there's a whole range of anonymous uh, charities as well that you can, there are helplines. Uh, and the way that mental health is spoken about now is monumental compared to when you and I were younger and growing up. Yeah. We weren't, it was almost as if we weren't allowed to talk about it. And now my old school, oh, yeah. there's an entire mental health department. You know, yeah. and when I was there, I didn't, as you say, I wasn't, didn't know that I was allowed to speak to the doctor about it. So it's amazing how much that there's been developments in, in, in it, especially in the educational and infrastructural kind of system. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I was younger, I remember if anyone spoke about mental health, they were like branded a weirdo, like no one go near them, don't come near me. It was very like, it was really like, you just didn't want to talk to no one about it. But yeah, now, like you say, it's great. Like, I think with a lot of influencers coming out, talking about mental health, a lot of kids look up to them. I've had young girls and guys and mums, dads message me and say, the podcast that you do where you talk about things and the interviews that you've done and how open you've been on your social media, they were like, you've literally changed my relationship with my kids. Like, you've changed my life or things like that. And I'm like, that's why I'm doing it, so that everybody can feel normal and accepted and understand that if someone like me can go through it, they can and they will be all right. I think what you said is probably the most important part of it. It's the fact that it should be normalised because (laughs) you felt like you were the only one probably when that you that was doing this, this thing, but actually a whole number of people, young, old, whoever actually do this for whatever reason and not to say that the act should be normalised, but there are solutions to it for everybody. Yeah, um, there, there are, is, yeah not, not the action so much normalised, but the feelings behind the action normalised exactly. so that the action actually doesn't become a reality and the, the feelings are normal and you can deal with those. 
it's a, a man being able to control that emotion and feeling uh, yeah. and fi- find finding a solution as well yeah definitely when i was doing the research for this episode bell i also you you previously talked about just earlier about self love and you were really struggling to love yourself now i wanted mm-hmm. to talk to you about previous relationships I know we won't we won't dwell on it too long, for that, obviously, because if you're listening to this, Belle just put her head in her hands. Um, do you think that some of the choices in your relationships would were, were down to a lack of self love and poor self esteem? Yeah, I, I definitely think that because of the lack of love for myself, I just I I feel like I really let myself down with the type of men that I was going for. I was going for. I was going for men that kind of were giving me this fake reality of like, I lo- it was very love bombing, very narcissistic. Now I'm educated on narcissism and mental like manipulation, honestly, emotional manipulation, I mean, sorry. It, it, I, it's like I'm an unstoppable force of like women empowerment I feel like because of what I've been through my poor boyfriend now he's like the nicest person I've ever met in my life and he just has to deal with all of this I mean he'll put my pink fluffy robe on and he's like women are the best (laughs) he's with me on it now so he's got no choice I mean I've got I was talking to him about men the other day my my friend was having a um argument with her boyfriend and I was like you know what these sorts of men I was like they're just they're just trash these sorts of men that she's going for they're trash he was stood there, he's got long hair, so he had all his hair down, and I mean, he's lovely, and it's curly, and it's lovely. And he goes, he's in my pink, fluffy robe, and he goes, you know what, babe? And at this at this moment in time, he's also moving my handbags to the other side of the room, so he's holding my handbags, and he's like, you know what, babe? I couldn't agree with you more. He was like, men, they're just rubbish. And I was like... <laughs> Right, you know what? I was like, you know what? We've reached Honestly, a new level of reality. I he, didn't think he, that it would exist. Yeah, he he is like he's just embraced the whole the whole women in power, the whole female empowerment movement, and he loves it. So that's what you need from your men. Um, but yeah, I I have had a fair share of, of bad relationships. You know, with my longest relationship ending in him cheating on me gaslighting me lying about it when I found out it was all lies and then also ended up with him getting quite physically violent with me um I think I've always been in relationships that have been quite violent that have been quite you know it's just they're just they're just quite aggressive the arguing you know the the language used, there's certain barriers within arguments that you should never cross, ever. And the way that you talk to your partner and the way that you, you know, you conduct yourself in an argument with a partner. And I think that because I've always had these boyfriends that are so, like, loud and quite aggressive, I felt like that was normal and it's not. And it's only within getting older and seeing how, actually, no, you shouldn't behave like that and seeing my brother with his girlfriends and things like that I've really been like, you know what, this isn't normal. Why am I accepting this? You know, my brother pulls me to the side and he's like, all you do is look after these men and they abuse you. He was like, when is someone going to look after you? As my little sister, when are they going to look after you? Let's talk about Love Island, but only very briefly because I've got a whole whole range of other things to talk about. What I want to talk about about Love Island is, were you aware of the impact that this would have on your life before going on the show to then the realities of it. And maybe this is with hindsight talking. I don't know. But let's talk about beforehand what you felt before going in. I literally had no idea what was about to happen. I had literally no clue. It was mental. I came out of that villa and, like, it was madness. Like, absolute madness. I remember my dad, he came in um, when the parents come in Love Island and he was like... I just want to let you know, don't panic, but like, you're a bit of a big deal. And I was like, no, 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 because obviously he he knows that I I don't want to, I don't like all this famousness stuff. Like, I'm like, I don't like it all. And he was like, don't panic. He was like, but like, you know, when you come out, it's going to be mental. He was like, it's mad. So my dad had a picture of me from Love Island and he, my press photo, and he had it plastered over the bonnet of his car. (laughs) 
blown up and plastered on the bonnet of his car because he was doing a rally at the time. So he's got like a lovely Mercedes G63 AMG, something or other with a convertible. I just see it as a nice car that has the roof off. I don't know, but he's got all these technical terms for it. So he did a rally. Um, there was like loads of supercars and it had on it the picture of me and it was like vote Bell and Hanson. So I had that. And then he um, he was like, whenever I drive the car, I have girls like screaming at me, like chasing after the car, like it through town. And I was like, no, you're lying. He was like, I've even had people that are on the, in the like, um, like van drivers, like lorry drivers. They're like, oh, who's that on the front? He's like, it's my daughter. And they're like, yeah, all right, mate. And he was like, no, 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 it is. Like, watch what you're saying, because it is actually my daughter. She's on the telly. <laughs> so he was like, I'm no longer Tama Hassan. I'm Bel Hassan's dad. He was yeah. like, hilarious. He was like, I've done all these films. He was like, I'm a credible actor. He was like, and I'm no longer known as myself. I'm known as Bel Hassan's dad. He was like, I kind of like it though. He's like, I'm all right with that. Oh, that's sweet. Oh, that's a good dad. What did it live up to expectations? Expectations of what? What do you mean? I don't know. What? What? Okay, then let's ask you that. What were your expectations of the experience? So not not the what would happen, but your experience on the show. Oh, then no, it didn't. It didn't. I I really thought that Love Island was going to be the most. Don't get me wrong; it was fun, but I thought it would be the, like a laugh. I thought it'd be the most fun. I thought it'd be really natural and like. Did just, you think it would be a kind of a romantic fairy tale experience or not? I didn't really know what to expect from it in that sense, but I thought it would be an absolute laugh where you could just run, run, run wild in a house and they would only ever interrupt if there was something serious going on. Absolutely mm-hmm. not. There is producers running in left, right and centre. So you, you are controlled as to what you can say or what you're asked when you go in the diary room. They ask you questions. So very rarely like you get to really like like if you're singing or you're mucking about or you're dancing like sometimes you'll be told to stop doing that because they're trying to film something so it isn't just like everybody run around do what you want to do it's quite scheduled hmm. so yeah that that was a bit like can't go to the toilet when you want you've got to go to bed when you're told to not allowed to know the time yeah i don't like the time thing i, I, I have to know the time no i don't like it it used to freak me out so when the girls used to come in the the like runners and stuff they'd leave their phone on the side and i'd be like what's the time mm. tap the screen and have it <laughs> quarter to six i haven't had my cup of tea yet <laughs> um so let's also talk about leaving the show and not only the short term of leaving a show like that particularly with now the history that comes with the show um and mental health what's your experience been like with dealing with the production company itself and how they've looked after you and indeed your other co-stars? I feel like they are actually, in talking to other years, I feel like my year, they definitely stepped it up a lot in terms of like being there and having help given. Um, When I come out, I was offered a lot, phone called a lot and asked if I wanted like therapy sessions, if I needed to speak to anyone. There were emails all the time. So they they were actually really there for us. I personally found it a little bit difficult. Um, I did speak to someone a couple of times and then I was all right. I was like, you know what, I'm dealing with some stuff. And it was it was more like they helped me as well a lot with like stuff that was going on with family, um, like just just loads of stuff, like boyfriends, relationships, things like that. So they were really, really good. And then you get like a certain time period where they sort of keep reaching out. And then after that, they sort of don't like your, it's more down to you if you want to reach out to them. Um, and then... Recently, I don't know if anyone's seen, but I had a little bit of an incident happen with the eye. Mm. Um, and they reached out straight away to my email, um, which obviously goes to my manager. She messaged me straight away and she was like, Love Island have asked if you would like to speak to someone and get any counselling or if there's anything they can do to help. So they have actually really, really been there for everyone. They have. That's actually really, really good about that experience in December then, because I I wasn't sure whether that would be the case if they felt that it was their duty and responsibility because of what they did for you to continue to give back to you or look after you and help you. So that's nice to hear. Yeah, they they reached out straight away and were like, is there anything we can do to help Belle? 
is there anything that she needs? Can we help at all? Um, does she need to speak to someone? Should we set her up with some therapy sessions? And they they were like really, really like they were really good. So my management, obviously I, I didn't feel like I needed to speak to anyone. So I don't want to waste anyone's time when someone else could be using that that may need it more than I do. Um, so I was okay. I kind of dealt with things with myself. My boyfriend was there for me a lot. My mum, my family. So I, I was okay. I dealt with that kind of kind of by myself. Are you happy allowed, Are you happy if I talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, as Just long as we've touched don't on bring it. Up anything like police wise? No, 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 no. I've Nothing to do with cases good. or anything like that. More just the. Um, it, it's going to lead on to the conversation with social media as well. Oh. But did you feel it necessary to switch off and realize actually there's a bigger picture in terms of reality there's much more to life than social media and going out uh, and doing this stuff and actually focus on the people such as focusing on yourself and the people that are in your close circle did you actually is it kind of a a wake-up call or a I don't maybe I don't want to say a wake-up call actually but you know a a snap back into reality it was kind of a slap in the face of reality (laughs) there we go yeah we'll go with that (laughs) It was, it was, do you know what, what happened in December? Yeah, it, it was literally and mentally and theoretically, it was a slap in the face back to like, right, okay, you need to, because when you come out of Love Island, you are literally like Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt for about six months. Everywhere you go, there are people jumping on you. Can I have a photo? Can I, like, you can't move. Like, if you go to a shopping centre, you are bombarded with people. If you go out anywhere, it's constant paparazzi or people asking for photos, things like that. And then it dies down and you kind of get your normal life back. And my mum was like, you've got to understand that when you go to these places, you can't just rock up. You can't just lick. Like, you have to have, like, a bouncer escort you out. So we actually know everybody at the club where it happened. Like, I know the owners, the bouncers. I know everybody that I've been going there. My dad's been going there. My brother's been going there for years. So... We know everybody there and they always look after me and they always say to me, before you go, please tell us and we will walk you to your cab. And I obviously I didn't that time because I was like, I'll just sneak off. I just go, I can just walk myself. And it was kind of a literal slap in the face of like, oh, you can't do that anymore. Like you need to remember that like you can't do things like that. And that is quite sad. And this is why I did such a big thing on social media about it because I get this a lot. I get girls start on me for no reason, nonstop. And if a guy comes over to me and they try it on with me and I'm like, not interested, they're like, oh, you think you're something, da 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 because you've been on the telly. And I'm like, no, I just don't fancy you. just not really a bit of me, babe. And weirdly Nine enough, th- if you hadn't checked, I've actually got a boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> so like, if you was actually a fan and you actually fancy me, you know I've got a boyfriend. That's what I think. But they go, you know, it is what it is. And I think, I put it out there because I know a lot of influencers that have dealt with similar situations that don't want to talk about it because they don't want to damage their rep- reputation or have people think differently of them or get known for being a rowdy person. Like, I think it's pretty clear to see that I'm somebody that doesn't take any nonsense. I will always stand my ground. If someone's screaming in my face, they'll probably get it back. Like, I don't ever start for no reason. And every brand, every person, everybody that's met me will know how I am and they love me for it so it is what it is and the thing is when somebody when you have your back to somebody and they just clap you in the face it's a little bit like I was like you know like I'm almost like where the like where has that come from and that for me I was like it was probably one of the first times I've ever been like okay this this could actually go really bad like I'm here on my own I'm just with my boyfriend like this could actually go quite bad. And that's where I was like, you know, I just remember thinking, oh, for sake, like, for God's sake. And I actually, as I walked off, I bumped into the owner of the club, one of the owners, and she she goes to me, um, she like deals with everything there. I mean, like, she is a scary woman. You would not want to mess with her. I love her and she loves me and I'm happy for that because if she didn't, I'd be petrified. But she was like, look, I'm going to deal with this. Leave it. Like, don't get involved. Don't don't do anything. Don't just go home. And I'm so grateful she did that. And she was like, just go. The girl is trying to get something from you. She wants to be noticed. Just go. And I was like, all right, you're right. 
within seconds, the girl was messaging me, you've done this, da 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 And I was like, oh, you know, like, I'm really trying to calm myself down. All right, I was drunk. I probably said a few things over text that I shouldn't have said. I will hold my hands up to that. I've never once lied. I stated it. She shared all of the DMs. It wasn't a secret. I shared them to my page. I held my hands up. But what she did to me was wrong. And that is it. I don't care what anyone says to you. I've had some people shout some horrendous things and I've never physically ever touched someone. And it, was, it wasn't before, it was after. So my followers forgave me for, for the, the few digs that I give, luckily. As we've established, with the show comes the opportunity for vast amounts of social media follows. And to date, I think you're sitting at just over a million followers on Instagram yeah. alone. And that's a crazy amount of people when you actually think a million people, if they were all in one place, that's a lot of people. I know. Do you feel the weight and expectation of fans and followers with each and every post and story that you do and that it has the right message and implication? How do you tackle social media? I, I, have, I have really felt a lot of pressure through social media and I kind of was like beating myself up about it. You know, I was really going for a bit of a hard time at the start of the lockdown and I think it was a bit of a weird time for everyone and I thought, you know what, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I'm the world's best blogger influencer because I'm not I'm still learning how to edit my pictures properly I'm still learning how to take pictures properly this wasn't what I did before Love Island and just like anything it can take five years for you to be good at a job so I'm still learning and I was like you know what? I'm just going to be honest with people and I was like look guys I'm, I'm struggling I don't know what to post I don't know what to talk about on my stories I don't know I don't know what to do I'm having a bit of a hard time I don't, I literally don't know what to tell you. I don't want to talk in my stories because I feel awful. I feel sad. I don't want to talk. And that's it. Oh my God. The amount of messages were like, Belle, I'm so glad you said this because we was all worried about you. You've gone missing for a couple of weeks. Where have you been? And I'm like, okay. And they were like, you know, this is what we want to see. Let us help you. So, so many girls are like, hi, babe. Like, I've seen your message. I, this is what we want to see. Like, we'd love to see like your makeup or your skincare or what clothes you wear. And I was like, why did I not just ask for help earlier? Like I could have just asked everyone for help. So this big expectation I put on myself. And really, if I'd have just gone to my followers, hi guys, what do you want to see me post? Do you want to see me acting a full on TikTok? Do you want to see me doing my hair? Do you want to see me doing my makeup? I would have probably been doing all right a lot quicker. So they, they actually really helped me. So I think the, the pressure for me now, I don't feel it so much. But, you know. How do you switch off from social media? Because it's not a traditional nine to five job, as anyone will know, because you can spend hours on it or you could spend a minute on it. How do you say enough is enough, say in a day, or you've done the work side of it? When does the work and maybe um, personal time come into it? Instagram doesn't really shut off. And this is, you know, what people should understand when they turn around and go, oh, I want to be an influencer because that is the best job in the world. It's 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. You don't get off time. It is constant. And with Instagram, if you are not, there's so many influencers now, if you are not constantly posting, talking to your followers and things like that, they just switch off. They're like, you know what? I don't, I don't want to follow you. I'm bored now. Next person. You will obviously get your very, very loyal fans and followers and they literally will talk to you every day. Like I've got so many people I've been talking to every day since I come out of Love Island. Like we're basically best friends. Like I talk to them more than I talk to my actual best friends. So, <laughs> you know, I talk to them all the time and they're constantly messaging me like, Belle, where did you get this from? Or what's this? Or what are you doing? I hope you're okay. How are you today? So, you know, you get some people that will literally follow you through everything and then you do get some people that are just like, you know what, there's a better blogger, there's, there's a new Love Island I would like to follow her, Belle's boring me now, I'm not interested. So it's, it's constant and everything that you do put on your platform, you should see as work because it's like, if you're going out, what are you putting out there? Will a brand see that? So it's not no longer your own Instagram, it's kind of like you've got to be careful what you put up. How do you associate or indeed disassociate from people who say things to you on social media then because of course you have the glamorous side of it where you've got brands coming to you with uh good deals involving cash but then you also have 
horrible trolls that are going to be saying horrible things about you with absolutely no weight or reasoning behind it whatsoever. And it's assumed that you just ignore it and your mental health is fine about it. How does that affect you or indeed how do you block it out? To be honest, I, I've been quite lucky um, with that. I don't get too much of it. Um, the, the more the more hate I really get is on like um, like columns of newspapers, like where people can comment. That is where I get the most. Um, but you know, like, what are they going to say? Like, oh, you're fat. Yeah, I've put some weight on. Like, well done. Like, what do you want me to do about it? I'm going to the gym. I've eaten chicken and veg all week. Like, what do you want me to do? Like, I think you you have to somewhat turn, like, the ignorant side of yourself to that. You have to just be ignorant to it because if you, like, you know, I read pretty much everything and I do see it, but it's like, I feel like I'm secure within myself. I know my flaws. I know what I am. I know what I'm not. So when someone's sitting there and they, they're like, you know, yesterday I did my first MUA Monday. So what I've started is doing a live video every Monday at eight o'clock. And it's just a place for makeup artists to share inspiration, different eyelashes that they like, different lip glosses that they like, different products that they, they want to know or different trends that are going around on Instagram, TikTok, just for a place that we can all like share our ideas. And yesterday, I think it was my first one. It went really well. I got a lot of positive feedback. And then you always get the one that's like, this is embarrassing. Why are you doing this? Yeah. And you know, and you just think, right, you know does that, what? Does that play on your mind? A little bit. That does a little bit. Because it's something that I was nervous about doing. It's something that I, makeup is what I do. It is some, it's what I did before Love Island. It is something that I love. And the reason I do it is because I love making people feel good. I love feeling good. I love making people feel good. I like seeing people come into our room doing their face and they leave a different person they're like so confident they come in all like shy and mm -hmm. they leave like with the confidence of Beyonce like what? they are yeah and that and that I love that that's so rewarding for me so when someone says something like that I'm like oh why would you say that I'm just trying to do something good here like I'm trying to get everyone's creative inspiration flowing like it's something positive on a Monday everybody hates Mondays it brightens up a Monday so I was like, oh, but, you know, then you get 10 great comments. So you just, you have to be ignorant to it. You just have to block it out and ignore it. Yeah. And that takes a strong mind, though. So I, you did yeah. take a long break off social media, didn't you? I, I say it's long. I mean, within perspective. Within reason. Yeah. Within reason. But it, that's important to do that as well. Give yourself some breathing space. Because as you say, you can either, sorry, it's, you know, it's three, six, five days a year. You have to... Give yourself some time, otherwise you'll just get burnout, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of influencers do. I've seen many influencers put on their stories. Like, Hi guys, I'm struggling for content at the minute. I've hit a bit of a block. I don't really know what to do. Like people think influencing is just taking a photo, posting it. It's so much more than that. You know, it's it's taking pictures, editing them, knowing where to take pictures, planning the outfit for the pictures, planning the outfit and the makeup to batch together and the hair and the this. And if the wind's blowing too much that way or there's a shadow there, not the right photo. If you edit it wrong, it looks too edited. If you don't edit it, you look like it's the, not a professional photo. So it's, it's finding like a balance between all of that. And I, I just... It's hard. Like you, you have to switch off at some point, even if it's a weekend you take off or a day or a night. Just switch it off. Just turn it off. I have a question for you then. Does um, Has your experiences with reality been affected by social media in the sense of when you're going out to certain places and doing certain things, are you always thinking, oh, is this an opportunity for me to be getting a photo? Should I be doing it? You know, is that, does that play on your mind as well? Yeah, definitely. I before Love Island, I was really like bad for that. I'd never get pictures anywhere. I'm I'm still quite bad for it now. Like I, I'm if I'm out with the girls, oh, I'm out with the girls. I'm not on my phone. That's it. Phone goes away in bag. Leave me alone. That's it. Couple of pictures. So now it's kind of like I always say to my friend when we go, I'm like, right, before you get drunk, you've got to get a photo of me. Just one, and then we're done. Get as, as pissed as you want. Get as drunk as you want. And that's it, we're off. Like, you can, uh, phone goes in bag. And she's like, all right. Like, everyone's kind of just got used to it now. But, you know, I've had amazing opportunities come from that where 
where a restaurant might go to me, oh, we, we, we'll give you a free dinner for you and your friend if you get a photo. So sometimes they don't complain. Sometimes they're like, you know what, it's worth it. We're getting a bit of free dinner. Yeah, exactly. I've got a, a, kind of a final topic that I want to talk about and feel free to tell me to not talk about it if you want. I just wanted to know what your experience with alcohol was like and how that affects your productivity, but also your mental health. Do you know what? When I first came out of Love Island, I felt like I couldn't drink properly. Like I was, I was so overwhelmed with how many people were talking to me or how many people were coming over. I just didn't want to be drunk. I didn't want to drink. I was really like quiet. I just didn't like it. So for a few months, I didn't drink. And then it got fun and I started partying a lot because obviously we were at events all the time. It was like, if you're not drinking, it was kind of getting a bit boring being there. So it was like, I was doing all these events and I thought, oh, you know, I'll have a couple of drinks. A couple of drinks leads into a couple more drinks. And then a couple of drinks leads into from the event, let's go to a club. And then you can imagine. The next day when you do drink, you're, produ- you're, not, you're not very pr- productive. You're not. You're just, you're just not because you're just tired. You want to lay in bed. You want to eat McDonald's. You, you end up getting out of shape. So drinking is good in moderation. I would say anything that you do in moderation always because if it's not in moderation, it's just, it does affect, for me, it, it does affect productivity. Productivity? Is that, that yeah. is the right one. Yeah, 100%. I didn't know if it sounded right coming out there. No, 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 absolutely. Okay, so I suppose two final questions. What can we expect in 2022 then? From myself in 2022, you can expect a lot more content, but meaningful content. I don't just want to be posting any random stuff just for the sake of having a photo up. I don't want to do that. Um, MUA Mondays, every Monday, live on my Instagram and TikTok at 8 p.m., um, a lot more makeup tutorials. I'm definitely getting back into the makeup stuff. I Amazing. am in love with doing makeup. It makes me feel good. It makes others feel good. So a lot more to do with that. And also I, I want to start casting for films, auditioning for TV series and things like that. So I want to get more into the acting side of stuff, which is kind of what I've always wanted to do since I was little. So definitely that. There we go. And my final question that I ask every guest, what does the word headstrong mean to you? Oh, I'm unprepared for this. Um, The word headstrong means to me just being strong within your own mind, knowing how you're feeling, being quiet. What's the word I'm looking for? Being quiet, you know, assertive with your feelings, not letting anyone sway you, and just being, you know, strong in your like your head headstrong <laughs> absolutely Belle thank you so much for being so uh, so open and honest and talking to me I've really enjoyed it thank you for having me a massive massive thank you to Belle Hassan for joining me on this episode of Headstrong I really enjoyed having Belle on and I think it's fair to say that she's completely honest and completely true to herself in conversations like this If you have enjoyed this episode, please do share it with your family, your friends, your pals, whoever you think might enjoy it. And please do leave a rating, a review and subscribe. All this really helps me. All that's left to say is I will see you next week for another episode of Headstrong.